welcome and thank you for coming. I'm excited to see you here tonight. And uh, we, in this office, we try to teach people as much as possible. In, in, in addition to just adjusting, delivering the, the chiropractic care, we also try to bring you as much knowledge as possible in all of the, the aspects that support health. So one of the basic things we teach is that you have, in order to get, have health, you need to eat well, you need to move well, and you need to think well. So today, we're, we will talk about num number 12 here in our series will be about food additives. So this is part of the eating well. And what are food additives? Food additives is basically anything that they add to food that if you were to visit a farm a hundred years ago, those things didn't exist. It's, it's, uh, they, they do it because they have either taken something away from food, so they try and replace flavor, color, or aroma, uh, or they try to improve. If they think that nature didn't do a good enough job, they, they try to add on some flavor to it that maybe will make it sell better. And the other reason would be to extend shelf life. And we'll, we'll cover all of these and, and give you a perspective on, on what all of this is about. What does, what does it imply when they talk about shelf life? Uh, what does safe, when they talk about safe food additives, what does that mean? And with all of the preservatives that they add to food, what does that actually mean? So instead of just telling you, eat this, don't eat this, we'll try to give you a perspective so that you can make, make some smart choices for yourself. The first thing is, my, my favorite question is, is it safe? When you hear, when you read articles, you hear on TV, and, and you hear that they have determined that something was safe, how did they do that? I've always wondered. <laughs> so. In, in the slide, I found a few, uh, I went to WebMD and searched on food additives. And so they had, I, I just clipped a few, few sentences out. And these are citations, there's quotes. The truth about seven common food additives. So they claim to know the truth, first of all. Then they say, if like many Americans, you stock your pantry with processed foods, you may worry about how safe food additives really are. And then they go on to say, a scare over a food additive may linger in our minds long after researchers find that there's actually no cause for alarm. So in other words, they've determined it to be safe. And I think this is kind of humorous because basically what they do is they take a poison and they feed it to a lab rat and they determine how much they have to give the rat before it dies to kill the rat. Then they back off and they see how much do they have to feed the rat before it gets sick. And anything below that level is safe because it doesn't give you any symptoms. And that is basically, in, in principle, I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying a little bit, but that's basically how they come about with things that are safe. So. I have at the bottom of slide two here, is it safe to skip exercise for a week? Yeah, I mean, you can skip exercise for a week and you're not gonna have a whole lot of symptoms. So that would be safe. The question though is, is that a good idea? So it's not, the, the question is it safe is not really a good one to start with. We'd rather ask, is it a good idea? So, is it possible to prove that something is damaging to your health? I'd say so, yeah. You give somebody something and if they get sick, it wasn't good for you. So it's very easy to prove that something is bad. But how do you prove that something's not damaging? You give it to a million people and nothing happens, and you give it to a million and one and they get sick, then it wasn't good. So what I'm trying to say is there is no way for anybody to prove that something is safe. It's not possible because everyone is different and we just don't know the long-term effects of anything. So instead of using the, the, those words, we just want to try to start using 
we want to think about it, we want to have a philosophy about it, and we try to use some common sense about what, what to use and not to use. So even if it doesn't kill you immediately, it may still not be a good idea to eat it. And then on number four here, it's one of my favorite cartoons, Glass Bergen. There's the guy talking to the doctor and he says, everyone knows food is bad for you, but I don't know what else to eat. And it, that's kind of scary, but that's almost the point where we've come. That everywhere you look, there's something wrong with the food. I mean, what do you do? So there's probably no food that they haven't written something about it being bad for you. So what, what do you eat? Well, we've talked about these in, in previous, uh, previous lectures, and basically all you try to do is eat as natural as possible. Eat food the way that nature made it for you. So we're not going to uh, stay on that topic today. But when we talk about food additives also, we want to start asking some questions. Like, if they add something to a food, does, they, does this substance that they add, does it have any normal function in the human body? So food has a purpose. We talked about that a few times ago. Food is supposed to nourish. It, it does things for the body. Movement does something for the body. Movement creates impulses and signals that stimulate the brain. So there's a purpose for movement. A spine has a purpose. A spine protects certain sensitive areas and it creates a certain mobility and stability and it sends impulses. So all of these things were created by nature because they have a purpose. But when you look at artificial color, that is, it has no purpose in the body. It doesn't belong. There is no function, there is no way that you can make a case for that molecule to be entered into the body. So it's, it's a foreign entity and therefore it's, it's a stress to the body. Same thing with artificial uh, sweeteners and things like mercury and heavy metals. No one can make a case for that ever being a good idea to be put into the body. And one quote that I really like by Albert Einstein, he says, God does not play dice with the universe. And what I take from that is that everything that nature has created, and we're part of nature, has a, has a purpose. And all the food that nature created belongs in the human body. There's, there's a relationship that makes sense. But when we start making things in the laboratory, it doesn't make sense anymore. It just doesn't fit. There's no molecular fit for the things they make in a lab to, to fit in the human body. So, uh, there's a lot of text on the next one. We're not going to run through all of it. We just want to cover a few types of food additives. Then we'll talk about some of the main ones and, and we'll, we'll make a few more points. So, types of food additives. There are anti-caking agents, for example. They keep powders from, from sticking. There are anti-foaming agents so that the food won't foam. I've never had an issue with foaming food myself, but it must be there. Uh, antioxidants inhibit the effects of oxygen on food. That can be a good thing. Food coloring are added to replace colors that are destroyed during processing. So again, nature makes beautiful colored food. It's, it's very colorful. You have red bell peppers and oranges, and, and there's great color. But when we process the food and destroy the nutrients and the color, then we have to add color back to make it look appetizing. Uh, emulsifiers allow water and oils to remain mixed. Flavor additives give food a particular taste or smell, and, and so on and so on. I'll, I'll let you read the, the rest of it yourself here. We don't need to go through the list. I'll, I'll come back to most of these. So. Just to make a few points on each, anti-caking agents, again, they keep powders from sticking. So things like salt, for example, they, they frequently use, uh, use anti-caking. 
So the cheap salts, they use something called sodium aluminosilicate or sodium ferrocyanide. Okay? They don't sound good to me. I don't know about you, but those are, those are synthetic, they're chemicals, and they just don't belong. So in more expensive salts like sea salt and, and high brand things, they use calcium carbonate which is a naturally occurring thing in the body. And if we add something that, that has a place in nature normally, then that wouldn't necessarily be a bad food additive. I mean, we can make a case for it. But when they make it in a lab from, from silicone and from toxic substances, there's just no case to be made. Anti-foaming agents, again, prevent foaming. So in chicken nuggets, they put something called polydimethylsiloxane, okay? Doesn't belong. And did you know, by the way, chicken nuggets does not have even half of it chicken. There's like 37 ingredients, most of which are chemicals, okay? So just kind of start raising, being, being aware of, of what they're doing to our food so that you can make some, some intelligent choices. <coughs> and silicone oil is very often added to cooking oil to prevent foaming and deep frying. So even if they call it, they say, oh, we use all vegetable oil or all peanut oil, chances are you're still getting some silicone because they, they don't want their, their fries to foam. Antioxidants. That we talked about a little bit last week. Oxidation is a natural process, but when it happens too much, it creates free radicals. And those can be destructive to human tissue, and they also make food deteriorate. So what they often do is they add antioxidants to food. And some of those are actually not that bad, because they can add something like ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C. That's a natural antioxidant, so it's not really going to mess with you much in terms of, of being a food additive. Something else that's very common is something called tocopherols, which is basically vitamin E. Both of those are natural. But then if you start reading the, the list of ingredients on any processed food that you buy, for the most part you'll find one of the following. You'll find TBHQ, which is tertiary butyl hydroquinone. Those are, those are basically toxic. They're petroleum products. BHA, BHT, you'll find all of those in, in mayonnaise and dressings and so forth. When you have something with unsaturated, when you have fat that have unsaturated bonds, that means those, those bonds, those unsaturated places on the molecule they're nutritious for us because they have the ability to react. So they pre perform a function in the body because they are unsaturated. But because they're unsaturated, they also have a tendency to react with oxygen. So they're more sensitive. So that's where they often add vitamin E, for example. So when you have unsaturated fats with oxygen, heat, and light, that's where oils get rancid and create free radicals in the oils. So some of the, ex and what they do then is even though they start off with a vegetable oil or something that's reasonably good, they strip it of a lot of those nutrients. They sort of sterilize the oil from nutrients so that it have a better shelf life so it won't go rancid that fast. So we'll, we'll get back to this also to help you think a little bit more about that. Emulsifiers, These are some, this is something else that's added to virtually every food that you buy. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. The more, more natural emulsifiers are egg yolk and lecithin. And lecithin is something that your body makes. So when you eat a fatty meal, your gallbladder is going to release bile, which essentially consists of lecithin. And the lecithin helps the water and the oil mix so that you can digest it easier. So when they make a food where they want the fat to be dispersed in, in water, in fluid, then they use lecithin. So most any product you see, they're going to say something about lecithin, and that's, that's probably not a, a terrible thing. 
Some other natural emulsifiers are honey and mustard. And some other stuff you want to stay away from is another very popular one called sodium steroil 2 lactylate, which is purely uh, synthetic. And this is one of those cases where what I started off saying, how do they determine safe? So this is one example where they feed this to rats and there are no symptoms when they feed it less than two and a half percent of the diet. So I mean that's, that's a pretty substantial amount to, to not have any symptoms. But there is a lethal dose that if you give more than 30 grams of this per kilogram then you basically kill all the rats. And so they, they say, okay, well, this much will kill the rat, this much will not give any symptoms, so we'll reduce it a little bit more and we'll call that safe. And that's what they do with, with a lot of the things that they add to food. And they call it, they call it safe. It's FDA approved as a food additive. What they figured out then is in the US, they're not allowed to use more than half a percent in any food. And in Canada, they decided, well, you know, we think half a percent is not so good. We think that's dangerous. We'll call it 3.37%. But here's the question. Do you think it has no effect? Or do you think it has some effect? It's pretty obvious when you think about it. And then the next question is, if you take a tiny little amount of something that has some effect and then you get it from a hundred different foods and from multiple different sources and it's in virtually everything that you eat do you see how that could be a significant factor in the declining health of people so taking one thing and calling it safe and then allowing people manufacturers to put it in everything so you get a hundred times that it's, it's not a great idea I know this is slightly depressing, <laughs> so the reason we, we do, I don't want to sound like doomsday, uh, but it's hard to avoid on this topic because essentially there, there still is a solution and we'll get to that toward the end, but just, just bear with me for a little bit here. Food coloring is used to replace color that was destroyed in processing or to make food pretty or more attractive when they think that well you know this food isn't colorful enough to sell so we'll make it red or blue or green or they use it to mask natural variations so sometimes in margarine or butter or something that sometimes in the summertime is yellow sometimes in the winter is white well let's make it all yellow so people can't tell the difference that happens quite a bit also and there are some things called natural colors and I, I put that in, in quotation marks because they're basically allowed, they are derived from nature, but they're basically allowed to do anything they want to it in the process. So it may not be very natural before it ends up in your food. So caramel coloring is brown, that's based on sugar, annatto is reddish-orange based on a seed. Chlorophyll is green from blue-green algae, for example. And there's something called cochineal, which is red, which comes from an insect. Now, I don't know about you, but <laughs> I don't find bugs that, that appetizing. So they, they go down the list and there's some things that they derive here. But even though they call it natural food color, sometimes what they do is they dissolve this natural food color in a solvent, either hexane or acetone or some other color. And you know what? They don't have to tell you that they used acetone to give a better penetration of this color into food because the acetone is defined as a carrier substance. So they don't have to, def they don't have to label that. So even natural colors, you don't really know what, what they're doing with it. And even those so-called natural colors, even if they're properly derived, some of them like anato, which is a seed, cochineal, which is an insect, and carmine, which is also insect, 
they're very common as severe allergies. They've been known to give people anaphylactic shocks. So even natural, you, you gotta be a little bit careful with. And again, if nature puts some nice color to it in the first place, why mess with it? So if you eat the, the whole and natural food, you're, you're in pretty good shape. Flavor additives, and it's the same principle. You want to add back or exaggerate some kind of taste or flavor that was lost in, in processing. And I won't read all of this, but I put it in there for you. What a natural flavorant is. I cut this straight off of, of the, uh, some regulation on, on, that I found on the internet. So natural flavorant is anything that comes from the essential oil, oleoresin, essence, extract, protein, hydrolysate, distillate, yada, 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 derived from a spice, fruit, fruit juice, vegetable, blah, 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 portion, or fermentation products thereof. So they can do basically anything they want to it. They start with something natural, and there is no limit to what they can do to it. And if they add it to a food, it's still called a natural flavor. So you, you have to be a little cautious to, to things when they, when they call them natural. Flavor additives, uh, same thing, add back or exaggerate taste and smell. And here are some of the artificial ones. Uh, butter is actually, the, when you have a buttery flavor from something, it's actually dye diacetyl ester, when something tastes or smells of banana, it's actually isoamyl acetate. And there are some good books on this, uh, that if you read and look into this, there is an industry in this country that is so big, that if you buy a processed food, there is probably nothing that you taste that comes from a natural flavor. That they take the food apart, deprive it of all flavor, and then they use these artificial chemicals to put the flavor back in. So most people, especially kids, they, they hardly know what food tastes like anymore. They're, they're so accustomed, so habituated to these artificial flavors that you give them natural food and, and they don't even like it. So beware. And, uh, then another one is flavor enhancers. And these, the number one thing is called monosodium glutamate, MSG. And these, what they do is they, they enhance the flavor that's already in the food. So they basically trick the brain into activating cells, brain cells. The, when you taste something, you send a signal to the brain and if you add MSG to it, you strengthen that signal, you amplify the signal so that the brain perceives that this has more taste. The problem with this is that MSG contains something called glutamate or glutamic acid, which is a neurological stimulant. It's, it's a, an excitatory neurotransmitter that the body uses to send messages. But if you add it artificially, it stimulates that brain cell to death. And it's called an excitotoxin. So if you go to a Chinese restaurant and they put a ton of MSG in the food and it tastes really, really good, but an hour later you feel like a train wreck, then those flavors were stimulated, those brain cells were excited until they fatigued and fail and you all but went to sleep. So you damage some brain cells when you do this. And people can be more or less sensitive to it, but it's a huge issue and it's very well worth paying attention to. So here's another uh, little dilemma. Because people are getting more aware of MSG and trying to avoid it, they have invented 50 plus names for MSG. So now if you look for MSG, they might even say on the, on the product that contains no MSG, but instead they call it hydroly hydrolyzed protein or autolyzed yeast extract or any of those totally generic terms that basically means it has MSG in it. And they even FDA went after Campbell and Heinz for a number of years. 
but it was just too hard to, to keep track of it. They tried to find them for a while and then they said, no, it's too messy, we, we just won't deal with it. So I put on, on the slide there, go, go research it on the internet, find out, there's, you can easily print out the list of, of 50 things that they call it, and just do your best to, to avoid those. The foods to watch out for especially are salty snacks and soups and dressings because they virtually, it's almost impossible to find a ranch dressing, for example, without MSG. It's so common that the flavor that we know as ranch dressing is basically MSG. Now we're getting to some of the fun stuff. Preservatives. And why do they add preservatives to food? And the answer is really just one. They want to improve shelf life. And that makes sense from a money perspective because if food spoils, you have to throw it away. But if it stays edible, if it stays fresh for a year, then you can sell all of it before, before it goes bad. So it, it reduces spoilage and, and makes food cheaper. But what does it mean to improve shelf life? If you put something, if you put a food away and it doesn't spoil, what does that mean? It basically means that they have made it so unattractive that they have made it lethal to microorganisms. Because microorganisms were the things that were, and, and, and oxygen and so forth, are the things that make the food deteriorate. So if you preserve a food and nothing wants to eat it, then it has shelf life, <laughs> right? But what it also means is that if it has shelf life, it, it cannot sustain life. And the, the preservatives that they add, they're basically a poison that is designed to kill off things that have the similar cell membrane and, and cell structure that you and I have. So you think if it kills them, if, if the food gets so unattractive that they don't want to eat it, it probably doesn't have much value for you anymore. Okay? So think about preservatives in, in that sense. So preserve is basically to contaminate something. And then artificial sweeteners. Now we're getting to the stuff that if you have if you didn't hear anything else I say, just just listen to artificial sweeteners. There's three kinds that are the most common on the market. They are the, the, the pink, the blue, and the yellow pack that you find everywhere. And the, the pink is the saccharin, sodium saccharin, which is also called sweet and low. The blue is aspartame or NutraSweet. And the yellow is the latest, that's called Splenda, or the chemical name is sucralose. So what we have to understand about these is that they were all developed by pesticide companies. These companies were in the process of developing poison to try to kill something when they found that this powder that was floating around in the air all of a sudden was very, very sweet. It was extremely sweet. So now they say, okay, we'll take it, we'll modify it this way to kill bugs and we'll modify it slightly this way and make a commercial sweetener. And the FDA turned down, I mean FDA is, is, they let a lot of stuff through, but they turned down aspartame eight times before it was finally approved. And it was based on some study that was funded by the manufacturer of aspartame. Since then, aspartame is responsible for more FDA complaints. When people have something outrageous happen to them, they go blind or deaf or they, something happens, and FDA gets a formal complaint, that doesn't happen much. But since aspartame was introduced, aspartame has accounted for more complaints than anything else, than everything else combined. Okay, more than 50% of the complaints are aspartame. So these are very, very potent neurotoxins. And aspartame or NutraSweet, when it breaks down in the body, 
it falls, it breaks into four different things. It makes asparagine, which is a natural amino acid, uh, and that uh, further further falls down into or or becomes aspartate, aspartic acid, and. Like I said, this is a natural thing, it's a neurotransmitter, but just like MSG, if you add it externally to the body, then it becomes an excitotoxin. It stimulates the brain to death. It also breaks down into phenylalanine, which is important for people with phenylketonuria. But this is a pre also a precursor for neurotransmitters. So again, if you add it externally, you shift the normal balance and you have a brain imbalance as a result. The really good stuff it breaks down to though is methanol, wood alcohol. That's the stuff that pretty much guarantees to turn you blind if you get drunk on it. Okay? Some desperate alcoholics have been known to drink methanol and they don't see ever again. That's how, how bad this stuff is. EPA says that more than 7.8 milligrams per day is unsafe, and yet one diet soda contains 16 milligrams, more than twice the safe EPA limit per can. And finally, it, it becomes formaldehyde. You know what formaldehyde is? It's what they, it's embalming fluid, all right? You want to drink that? <laughs> I don't think so. It's such a potent carcinogen that the World Health Organization says you can't have any more than 0.5 parts per million. I mean, those are such infinitesimal amounts. And, and yet, they sell this on a regular basis and you have people drinking a six pack per day. And it shows up. They do have health problems. Sucralose is the last one. The Splenda and we were told cheerfully that this is a natural product it's made from sugar oh yes we modify it a little bit but we just use a natural compound we use chloride to to modify it well again if it's made from sugar it's not sugar anymore who cares what it used to be after they modified it but chlorine is not in sea salt Chlorine is not salt. Salt is in the form of chloride, and chlorine is a poison and a carcinogen that you make in a laboratory. It's a poison gas. It's an extremely potent bleach, and if you inhale a little bit of chlorine gas, you will pretty much won't have any, uh, any surface of, of the inside of your throat again. I mean, it pretty much just rips it out. Mm. Now, when they start with sugar, they start with a carbon molecule, and then they jam on a chlorine molecule onto it. And this kind of bond does not exist in nature. It is very, very unnatural, and it is extremely toxic. All the other, when, when they do this, they, they, it makes a compound called chlorocarbon. And all of the other chlorocarbons are poisons and insecticides. They're some of the most potent. And you may have heard of another one, another chlorocarbon called DDT. Hmm. Okay, that was banned in 1972. They replaced it with dieldrin that was banned in 1974. And all these are chlorocarbons, just like Splenda. Aldrin was banned in 74. Chlordane was banned in 88. Trichloroethane was banned in 2002. And then they make Splenda in 2007, and they put it in all sorts of healthy diet foods. And they say, oh, well, it's just made from sugar. Okay, Don't, don't buy into that. It's just a matter of time before they start finding just as many things as with any of the others. So, this was the depressing part. I apologize. <laughs> but it's even more depressing to think that you didn't know this stuff and you went on to eat it and your life quality suffered for it. So, what do we, what do, we do with all this? Well, 
realize that you want to eat a minimum of processed packaged food because it all contains all this stuff. So the more that you can eat whole and natural food, if you're out, go to reputable salad bars. When you eat food at home, try as much as possible to eat the whole food the way that nature made it. That's the simplest and the best advice that, that I can give. Real food is perfect just the way it is. There's no need to add color or flavor or aroma or anything to food that nature made because it's already perfect. And if something spoils, if you have lettuce, if you have spinach, if you have all these things in, in, in your house that spoil, it's because they have nutrition. Food is supposed to spoil. That's what happens. If it has nutrients, they will degrade because nutrients interact with things. So if things don't spoil, they have no nutrients. It's basically as simple as that. And the other thing that I would like to say at the end is to encourage you that you have power because manufacturers only make things that they can sell. And if you don't buy them, they'll stop making them. Guaranteed. So when you put your dollars, when you vote with your dollars and you start buying the, the healthy stuff, when you stop buying the processed stuff, I guarantee you if nobody in this country bought anything with Splenda for a month, they wouldn't make it anymore. Why would they? So, it all starts with, with the individual and one person can tell another person and we can become more aware and, and we can spread the message. And that's the only th way anything has ever changed really. Sorry for the, for the dismal tone of the message, but again, we're better off to be aware and be able to make some intelligent choices than, than to just be ignorant. So. At the end here I have one cartoon, it's this guy at the corner, he says, he's holding his sign up, he's standing on the freeway, he says, will work for low calorie, all natural, locally grown, gluten free, whole food with minimal packaging. <laughs> so the awareness has to reach that guy too, that's when we got it made. Thank you very much and I'll see you next week.